Well, hello, I'm Genevieve Edwards and I'm Chief Executive of Bowel Cancer UK. And I'm delighted to introduce you to Professor Mark Saunders, who's a consultant clinical oncologist at the Christie Hospital in Manchester. And Mark's joining me today to answer your questions specifically about the treatment of bowel cancer. So thanks for joining me, Mark. Yeah, well, thank you for inviting me on the Zoom call today. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, it's great. We've got some really interesting questions, so I'm going to dive straight in if that's all right. Yeah, no problem. The question is uh, from someone who says, I've just finished my fifth session of chemotherapy mid-March. I started on K-Pox, but I was switched to Fulpox due to severe diarrhoea. My sessions were stopped due to COVID-19. My peripheral neuropathy, particularly in my feet, has got worse since stopping chemo and seems to be progressively getting worse. I now wear fluffy socks to bed and during the day, even when the weather is really warm, which helps. I also go walking for 30 minutes to two hours every day. Is it likely to continue to get worse and be long term or will it start improving again? OK, um, well, that's a, it's a very good question. It's a problematic um, um, question as well. If I split it into two, um, the K-pox is a combination of oxaliplatin and capsitabine, and sometimes that can cause a bit more diarrhea than Folfox, which is a combination of oxaliplatin and 5-FU. And both are as good as each other, and some combination suits some, and some suits another, but they're both good. Um, <clears throat> but they both have oxaliplatin, and oxaliplatin can cause this um, peripheral neuropathy and anybody that's yes. had oxaliplatin will notice that their hands get really tingly and cold and if you drink something um, then you get up sometimes a really horrible feeling in your throat as you're drinking something and that's the oxaliplatin and the more of it you have um, the more likelihood is that um, you will get um, this tingling which lasts longer and longer and it gets to a stage when they stop the oxaliplatin because it's just causing too much tingling. And usually what happens in 90% in of people, you will have tingling at the end of the course, but it will get better. And so most people it will get better, and, but it can take a long time. It can take many months to sometimes a year or so to get better. <clears throat> and so it, it can be a real nuisance for people with tingling in their toes and their, um, and their fingers. Sometimes when you're writing or eating or when you're playing with your computer or your iPad, it's a nuisance. But I think it sounds as though the person who asked the question is doing the right thing in terms of trying to protect their feet, keep them warm. And the hope is that it will get better. Um, I'm afraid there isn't a magic tablet that will get it better. Um, people have tried acupuncture, people have tried chili creams, for example, because it gives you another funny tingling sensation. Anybody who's chopped hot, hot chilies will know you're more worried about the chili sensation. It might take away the numbness situation. So people have tried chili creams, but there isn't anything that's great, I'm afraid. You just got to give it time and protect your hands and feet while they get better. Yes. That's really helpful. Thank you, Mark. So hope on the horizon, but it could be a little while before it does improve. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, let's keep fingers crossed it gets better, yes. Yeah. So our next question is from somebody who says, I was diagnosed with nose, node positive rectal adenocarcinoma. CRM was involved, no MV, six centimeter tumor, low anterior resection in February and pathology came back as nothing left. Mm, that's great. Oh, it's good, right? A course of... Yeah, I mean, that bit is extra because it means they must have had a really good response to the treatment. And everybody that has such a good response does better, really. So I think it's the same with everything in this world. If you respond really well to it, then you're likely to do better in the long run. So that's a really good, good thing. Yeah. Mm. Now they go on to say that a course of capacite... Oh, now, how do you say that again? It's capacitabine. Um, it's, um, it's a tablet form of 5-FU and it's commonly used for a number of cancers, bowel cancer, in particular breast cancer as well but it's usually a well tolerated tablet you take twice a day so that was due to start in march but the consultant recommended it didn't go ahead because of the coronavirus so yeah the consultant said some trusts wouldn't offer chemotherapy due to my pathology my question is why is there no guidelines for rectal cancer in this scenario also i'm worried sick that my chances of preventing spread have now been removed can you okay reassurance or recommendation okay well i think the um there's two sides of that i think if we 
the COVID bit. It's a problem for so many patients with bowel cancer and every cancer at the moment. And um, it is getting better though. So the end of my little chat is definitely getting better. But at that time in March, it was new. We all didn't know really what was happening. We saw these stories of um, China and st stories in Italy. And um, it could have been absolutely awful. And, it, it, and, and there's no denying it. Um, um, anybody affected by COVID-19, it, it is life-threatening, it can be dreadful. Yes. Um, but at that time, we didn't really know how, when, how patients with cancer would cope with it, um, especially if they're having chemotherapy and um, they then haven't got the fight to try and fight off any infections. Mm -hmm. And so we at the Christie and many centres cut right back um, on chemotherapy because we're trying to protect patients at that point so probably at that time they said no to chemotherapy to protect that patient who asked the question because they didn't want them to make them bring them into hospital where probably more people with um, um, COVID-19 around and they didn't want to actually affect their um, um, immune system to stop them fighting any infections like the viral infection of COVID-19 so I think that was pretty common at that point is not to give chemotherapy. Now, to go on to the second part of the question, I've already said that that person is likely to do a lot better because they had such a good response. And um, if you um, look at trials in the past of people that have had chemo radiotherapy and then had chemotherapy afterwards or no chemotherapy, it actually, they didn't recruit well because people either wanted to give chemotherapy or have it or they didn't want chemotherapy and they didn't want to give it uh, the clinicians didn't want to give it and so actually the trials never recruited that well so can we absolutely answer that question i can probably say we can't really that actually um after you've had chemo radiotherapy and had such a really good response they can't find tumor there's there's no real proof that we should be giving chemotherapy then and um but all i can say is that person should do a lot better because they had such a good response and i don't think not having chemotherapy has severely um disadvantaged them for the future it might well have protected them and saved them from all the awful effects of covid19 right okay well that's a really that's really interesting to know thanks for that mark and would you advise that person if they have any further questions to get back in touch with their clinical team? Yeah, I think that's it. It's a sort of a commonly asked question and we're always asked, should we have chemotherapy? And they, they do listen to the nurses and the doctors there. Mm. And yes, you should ask their team, definitely. Brilliant. Well, my next question is, uh, is an, another interesting one. It says, I have recently been told I have multiple lung metastases to both lungs but I've been told to have a break from chemotherapy. I am being re-scanned again in August, so I'm watching and waiting. What is the usual thinking behind this type of decision? Um, again, these are excellent questions, another good one. Um, it's essentially, it's um, another fairly common scenario, um, is that um, when you get somebody with lung metastasis, the first thing that I would think of and any other oncologist would think of is, is um, is that the only site? Is that, is that, if that is the only site in the lung that it hasn't spread to anywhere else, such as the liver or, or, or other places in the body, then the next thing is, can you resect them or can you irradiate them? And usually you can do that if there's only one or two lung metastases. But if there's multiple lung metastases um, throughout both lungs, then um, you can't irradiate them or cut them out. And so then you start to think, well, what do you do? do what treatment do you give? And the obvious one is chemotherapy. And um, chemotherapy is given to try and um, obviously make people live longer, but also to control the effects of the cancer. Now, if somebody has got um, small lung metastases, they're very well, they haven't got symptoms from the lung metastases, metastasis, um, then um, sometimes it's best not to give treatment because we just heard in the previous questions there, especially the first one about um, oxaliplatin, a lot of the side effect, a lot of the chemotherapies give side effects. Mm -hmm. So you then be giving chemotherapy to somebody with asymptomatic lung metastasis, a metastasis that are not causing any problems, um, and making he or she poorly, um, 
and you wonder why really um, because um, actually it could be better to leave them as long as they can without chemotherapy and start chemotherapy at the right time and so normally we would carry out CT scans every three months and so we have quite a lot of people with either um, asymptomatic lung metastasis or asymptomatic nodal metastasis and we're not treating them but we're keeping a very close eye on them with CT scans every three months and if they get obviously larger or especially if they're causing symptoms and in the case of the lungs it could be a cough or it could be breathlessness um, or sometimes people can cough up a little bit of blood and then we would say look this is the time to give chemotherapy and then we'd go through the different treatment options that are available right that's interesting and of course if people are worried about coronavirus symptoms one of the most common ones we've been told to look out for is a cough isn't it it is yes that's it so uh, back with you now after a little technical difficulty and I've got some questions for Mark. Um, Mark, question here from someone who says, I was told that proton beam <laughs> was suitable for bowel cancer, yet a clinic in Reading called Rutherford advertised that they can use their beam for bowel cancer. What's the position on this? Um, I don't know what um, um, Ruther Rutherford are offering, but um, certainly there isn't a definite role for, protein, uh, for protons in bowel cancer at the moment. Um, we have a proton unit, luckily at Christie, and I know there will be one down in London. And so um, we do have a lot of people working on protons, and we have um, a consultant that is, has a particular interest in protons and bowel cancer. But um, at the moment, it's very much in research, and we don't have any setup for trials because the whole unit is is aimed at trying to treat all the people that definitely do need treatment with protons um, in the future um, it may well be that we do use protons for example um, for some uh, types of boosts or some type of treatment for anal cancer it might well be that if there's a small area of cancer we can't get to um, um, that um, surgically that we could um, have a protocol with protons then but um, all protons are is a, a very flash new type of radiotherapy. We already have very flash radiotherapies. People hear of um, things like CyberKnife and Sabre, all these yes. names. And they're just a really flash radiotherapy as well. And so sometimes we use them. So we have something like Sabre, this, this very focused radiotherapy we use for um, lung metastasis or liver metastasis or areas of nodal metastasis. So I don't think at the moment it's a great loss not having protons because there are very very good radiotherapies around that can work very very well really interesting yep. technology is just developing so much isn't it They're going so fast exactly you're right yeah yeah well my last question that I've got for you uh, Mark is from someone who says I was due to have treatment as part of a clinical trial at the Christie in March but this was cancelled due to the risk of catching COVID-19 um, when will this cancer treatment restart as it feels like cancer patients like myself have been put to one side and I, I'm, I'm guessing this is something that I know that we're hearing quite a bit about and, uh, and, and you must hear as well. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with you. and I, I do sympathise for patients this way. Um, I, as I said in a previous question, we were stopping a lot of, not stopping treatments, but actually changing treatments to much, try and make it safer for patients in March. Um, and um, we were doing that for good reason. It was a new horrible virus. We had to change um, to protect people. And um, um, at that time, sometimes trials um, of new drugs that we really don't know if they're going to work or not might well be putting the, the patient at risk of a problem, but actually not providing with benefit. So at that point, trials, um, a lot of trials were stopped. It also wasn't always down to the hospital. Um, most of the time, the actual company or the organization that arranged the trials actually stopped us from doing the trials. So this sponsor told us, look, you may want to do this job, but you can't do it. Um, and so it often, I'm not saying taking the blame away, but actually it was a mix between the Christie or other hospitals not wanting to treat and also the sponsor. But um, we have now open trials um, at the Christie and I know other centres are as well. It's a, a slower process because we have to build up again. 
And also a lot of the people that are involved in the clinical trials at Christie were actually um, redeployed to try and help with the COVID crisis. So we saw people that we knew regularly, they were on the door screening people. They were on the door taking um, swabs off of people um, and taking temperatures off of people. Um, and so actually a lot of the research staff were not doing nothing because they weren't doing research. They were doing other things for the COVID crisis. And now we're slowly bringing them back and we're slowly starting up trials. And so we have got a range of trials for um, people with bowel cancer. Um, and I'm not sure from the information you've given me about what trial that was. And so some trials are open and some aren't yet. And we're slowly bring them in because we want to do them safely as well we don't want to rush in and open everything and then can't and then put patients at risk so i would say to that person that um, they perhaps need to contact the um, team at the Christie, whether it was me or one of the other consultants to find out is that trial open and can they be considered for it oh that's great that's and a good question yeah it, it is isn't it and i know that services like yours have had to pivot so much to accommodate uh, the response to the coronavirus, but also make sure that you can continue delivering your services safe yeah. for, your, for your patients too. So a uh, huge amount of work's gone on. Thank you so much for your time. I, today. I think if, if I can add to the coronavirus a little bit as well, I think the thing that I feel very sorry for with patients is that to try and protect everybody, um, we only allow one person in so the patient can come in but not a relative and that's very difficult when you're actually trying to go through complicated treatment or give um, news that can be quite disappointing at times and sometimes we're doing it um, over the telephone um, same as I'm zoom calling here we're doing it on the telephone I suppose then uh, other people can be present in the room and people are using phones with um, speaker phones and all different technologies so we can actually try and communicate as much as possible. And I think we at the Christie and every hospital are trying to do, trying to carry on as best we can to make it as safe for every patient as we can. And, and things are getting better. We're seeing a lot more now. Um, we're wearing masks. Patients are wearing masks. Mm -hmm. It's still um, a, an ongoing service, but it's hopefully a safe service when people come in for what is difficult treatment. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for everything that you're doing uh, and all your colleagues. Mark, we really, really appreciate it and for your time today. I thought that was a really useful discussion, um, despite the little technical hitch in the middle. <laughs> so great to have your insight and your experience on the questions that really matter to people with bowel cancer right now, today. Um, I really appreciate your offer as well for, for us to do another one of these, you know, down the line, yeah. I'm sure people will continue to have more questions as their treatment evolves and, and those services reset. Um, so yeah. anybody watching this at home, if you want the latest information on and guidance about coronavirus and bowel cancer, um, have a look at the dedicated hub um, on our website, which is bowelcancerukorguk forward slash coronavirus. Mark, thank you so much. As ever, such a pleasure talking to you. Um, and thank you, Jen. I think the charity such as uh, Bowel Cancer UK is hugely important in these difficult times and um, I will con continue to support them and I hope um, patients and relatives will continue to think of charities such as Bowel Cancer UK at this very hard time. Thank you. Thank you for your words, Mark, and your time. See you soon.